Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for attending this, uh, this talk about the state of the code. Uh, I hope the title is not, not quite misleading. <laughs> and so um, I'll, I'll get into the topic a little bit. Uh, uh, so I am, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, Alex Huang. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, CloudStack. Uh, uh, today I serve as an architect for Cloud Platform, which is a product based on CloudStack. Uh, and I'm a committed and a PMC member uh, for Apache Cloud Stack. So uh, the reason why I, uh, why I hope my talk is not, uh, the title is not misleading is that I didn't really want to go into the, um, where the state of the code is in terms of commits and lines of code and, and number of features in, in the last two years that we've been in, in uh, Apache. Uh, I want to more kind of go over in terms of CloudStack's uh, original design principles and how the code is reflecting those um, design principles and the changes that we've been doing in the last two years as to uh, kind of uh, uh, reflect that. Uh, so when, when you look through Cloud Stack, Apache CloudStack's uh, wiki, it, there, there's a 101 page uh, uh, talking about uh, Apache CloudStack. And, the things that you would see is things like, I, for CloudStack, it's designed to do uh, infrastructure orchestration, and it provides a self-service and administrative control. Uh, so uh, there's a certain number of things that goes with that. Uh, uh, for one thing, you, and the code must be modular, or um, allow other people to add, add hardware without uh, um, conflicting with others. Uh, so that goes into the design of CloudStack when you look at it from a very um, beginning level. Um, uh, but as you deploy CloudStack and move more into uh, a much uh, higher scale in terms of the machines and VMs that it manages, then you start to think about CloudStack in terms of scale. Uh, how, how does it manage these VMs and how does it manage the operations inside this data center? Um, and, and and then I think once you move that past that point, then you will see a, what happens when the system is under scale and there's a fault that happens. And, and CloudStack needs to be designed against that type of uh, failures. Uh, that type, um, so it needs to have this type of fault isolation built in. And so these are kind of the design principles that we kind of, when we looked at the features in CloudStack and the code in CloudStack, those are the things that we need to think about. Uh, uh, or else something can fail out within a data center and people have problems um, and, and the problems can be uh, quite, uh, quite drastic. All right. So when you, CloudStack is a little, is a little bit, based on a variant of this uh, uh, set of architecture, the stage event-driven architecture. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with that, uh, it basically is a way to um, design CloudStack into multiple stages, or uh, a certain process into multiple stages that are separated by queues. Those, and each stage is an independent task, as, and it has to be driven by finite state machines. And, and what this does is that as the process as flows through these queues, you sh you're supposed to be able to adjust and fine tune the queuing mechanism so that uh, it can and handle the load and, and figure out where the bottlenecks are and, and, and handle the load that is processed through it. Uh, CloudStack is very unique in the systems that I worked with before because CloudStack has to manage a set of hardware uh, that uh, have different response times um, and runs a, a set of operations that may have long running end times. Um, and so when we first uh, designed CloudStack, then we've decided that this is the best way to do it because uh, as a, as a, a operation runs through CloudStack, then you should be able to um, uh, use the queuing que mechanism to to wait for a long, uh, a long running process or, or separate yourself from a hardware that has, uh, um, has, a, has a fault and will not return on, on responses, for example. Uh, so let me go through that a little bit. I'm not sure if this is quite readable. It looks like it's readable from, on the big screen. It's not quite readable on my little screen here. Um, so in CloudStack, when it first comes through, 
Oh, uh, we, when it receives the HTTP request, I mean, most of you know, HTTP servers will have a queue you know, that, that handles the, the requests that comes in. And, and if, it is, if, if the request is something simple, or uh, some database operation, and then it just performs that return. But if it is a long running process, and, and for those of you familiar with the code of CloudStack, these are the async commands in CloudStack, uh, then they get filed into a, a job queue Oh, and there is a, a job process that goes through uh, and takes them out of the queue and starts processing them. Um, and for any operations that has to do with a VM starting and stopping a migration, uh, that job queue actually uh, files it into a virtual machine manager's queue um, that, um, that runs through the entire orchestration of the VM start. Um, and when, when the virtual machine manager decides that it needs to contact the actual hardware to perform a certain provisioning task, then and it, it sends a command over to an agent which has uh, a queue of its own that processes that. Uh, and then and, um, there's other events that can happen. There's, there's uh, agent monitoring that happens with um, uh, uh, in, inside management server, inside CloudStack's management server, agents uh, have application pings back to that queue, um, and as that uh, processes it, uh, it might determine that a, a, an agent has run down, or hardware has run down, and HA gets uh, gets kicked off. Of uh, and that, and when that happens, HA has its own queue uh, where where these events get filed, and then it starts the process. And when when HA uh, starts that process. Yeah, it will also signal the virtual machine managers to start the uh, VM um, start process. And so therefore it files an event with, uh, with the virtual machines and manager's queue. Uh, queue. Uh, and for security pro good programming, for example, there, it has its own separate process and separate queue again. And so uh, you can see in clouds like that, these, these queues are actually quite prevalent in, in CloudStack's uh, code. Oh, no. And when we look at, um, when we look back at infrastructure orchestration and this, uh, this scaling mechanism, um, so these two things actually uh, somewhat aligns because when we're doing infrastructure, when we're orchestrating for a certain hardware, we want to make sure that orchestration does not uh, uh, conflict with other code or does not have problem with other code. So the, so uh, that code needs to be uh, fairly modular, right? Uh, and that module basically fits into a particular stage in, in, in this architecture. Um, so the, those two, uh, the scale and the modularity of it is, is actually uh, somewhat interrelated. So in the past two years, we've been doing quite a bit of work are in CloudStack's infrastructure and architecture to make this service up uh, uh, better. Uh, uh, I think and quite a few people have heard before that um, CloudStack is somewhat monolithic uh, in, in this architecture. Uh, and in general, I actually uh, somewhat disagree, uh, especially when I, when I, I first heard it, I, I disagree uh, very loudly uh, to uh, quite a few people. Uh, but when I went through our code, to go look at um, where are the interdependencies of uh, CloudStack, then I kind of do see that in CloudStack's code, there are, uh, the codes are somewhat intertwined with each other. Uh, and we have to go through and break that apart better. Uh, and so in the, in the past um, two years, we've been and doing quite a bit of work there. Uh, uh, we actually have percent, um, we, we actually have push all of our queuing mechanisms, the uh, job infrastructure, uh, uh, up above at a higher level uh, so that other, uh, other people who's writing code can actually take advantage of that uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, today, when you look at this diagram, the implementation of each of these queues are different. And they are done by different tables, different um, job processing, different thread queues. There's, there's actually no unified way of uh, doing it. And so a lot of people look at that and they get rather confused because uh, they don't know, they don't, they're not quite sure what each one is doing. Um, and so uh, in, 
uh, in 4.3, we unified the VM work queue you know, into the jobs framework. And then in the jobs framework, it also dis, um, uh, serves a interface where you can actually dispatch any of the jobs. So uh, the jobs um, framework will then take a job out and be able to dispatch it to a different set of code to, to work on the stage that it's supposed to work on. Um, um, there's an event bus uh, that was added to to further segregate the, the, the code so that uh, uh, you can listen on events and act on them rather than have to be called on, on where people have to know who to call in order for something to happen. Um, there is now, and, and because of that, then the, um, there is a, you have to be able to string through the calling contacts uh, so that when you're debugging, you know that you're actually working on the same, uh, the, these different threads are actually working on the same, same things. And, and we service the managed context uh, idea so that uh, we can propagate the same context to all the, the different threads and so that the logging would be the same and you, you can follow a job through, through uh, to its completion. Um, uh, for different um, resource stakes, uh, we uh, added uh, different resource stakes into uh, our, our hardware resources uh, as the ability to enable, disable, and inact, uh, inactivate a resource. Uh, um, where enable means that you can deploy on that resource, disable means that you cannot, and inactive means that you should not be deploying new, new, new resources, new um, things that require new resources onto that particular resource. And that controls the, the, uh, which queues we, we would deposit our, our commands onto. Um, um, we define a, uh, the FSMs better for, for a lot of the first class objects that we have in volumes and snapshots uh, so that uh, those um, processes that work on those particular entities as uh, we would be able to do better in terms of uh, breaking them into different stages. As we also break out our plugins, and um, and I, I I will show what happens on on, on the plugins there. Um, so and then there's also a storage refactor to allow us to define better stages for storage provisioning, volume provisioning for the VM. Um, and a lot of the framework have been pulled out of our, our server code and placed under a framework for all for all other code to use. Uh, so the, uh, this part I might have to refer back to a little bit. Uh, this is um, CloudStack's uh, software uh, architecture. Uh, um, when, you, when you look at it, uh, CloudStack's um, orchestration processes are all basically done by uh, this um, mo module in the middle that says the CloudStack kernel. Uh, we've renamed it now uh, called CloudStack Engine. And, and whatever this engine needs to orchestrate and push through, uh, are done through a set of adapters that uh, we place um, ad adapter interfaces. Uh, so for example, uh, if we need to program a certain network element, and uh, there's a network element and uh, interface that uh, you can um, program through. Uh, and other people can contribute code in the plugins where it, it implements these adapter interfaces and, and execute work for CloudStack. Uh, and there are um, business logic above uh, this orchestration code and there's a framework on, uh, on, underneath that helps with the clustering and, and pa message passing and data access layer. Um, so uh, this, uh, this um, uh, architecture is actually, when we first started with Apache, it was actually implemented by this type of dependency where uh, uh, each one of these circles basically represents a jar in CloudStack. Uh, and the uh, arrows the, uh, shows the dependencies am among them. And if you just look at that uh, when, when we started, uh, there's practically no way you, you, have, you would know what each one is. Uh, and this is why I, I said I need to go, may need to go back to the things that we've done, um, because a lot of the um, CloudStack code that went into the framework and infrastructure of CloudStack were actually in in CloudStack's um, uh, server package. That, so it, it was intermixed with CloudStack's uh, self-service uh, uh, business logic. Uh, and so th oh, then anyone who needed to use that infrastructure would also have compilation access to all of CloudStack's orchestration code. 
Oh, uh, and then and because of that, then and they can act. They don't know that there's a boundary between the plugins and uh, and that self-service code. Oh, uh, so oh uh, in uh, in the two years that we've been working on this, we basically have been pulling all of that up, uh, apart, uh, so that people know exactly what they're actually dependent on, and uh, so that they uh, and they know what they shouldn't go and access. Uh, so we put our parts in, in, into so many pieces that it is actually not uh, desirable for me to write, to, to draw that up onto the screen. This, it would be way too, uh, way too small for anyone to see. Uh, I, here I only showed basically the dependency package of CloudStack server. Um, and what, what we've done is we categorize most of the um, uh, CloudStack code according to the architecture that we were presenting in this, in this picture here, in the software architecture. Um, uh, framework is, uh, is a collection of um, uh, uh, jars that implements the different functionalities in CloudStack's uh, uh, framework, things like clustering and configuration and managed contacts. Uh, um, and API is anyone who wants to program against CloudStack uh, uh, would, uh, would um, depend on this API. Uh, and CloudStack's engine is its orchestration engine um, that does the VM controls and network controls and, and volume controls. Uh, and plugin, and plugin is today the, the biggest set of uh, uh, different jars that we have, uh, packages that we have, uh, where uh, people implement the different functionalities that CloudStack needs in this orchestration on uh, network functionalities, um, uh, storage functionalities, is, and, and then they, um, and on top of that, then we have the different services in CloudStack, uh, including the self-service uh, self of CloudStack and the management of um, uh, CloudStack resources. Uh, so if you take a look at today, the cloud uh, server, uh, which is the same cloud server in this diagram, the, the, middle, the, the middle circle in the, on, on the third row there. Um, previously, you would see uh, cloud server basically just says, oh, I, I'm part of cloud API. I, and any of the plugins are actually living within cloud server. So they can and talk to each other and, and, and could cross uh, these uh, calling boundaries. Today, cloud server is, um, much different, and it is relying only on framework and cloud API. I, and, the, and the schema in, in, in the cloud engine API. I, and so someone who is looking at and through this would, uh, would be able to tell uh, what server it actually relies on. And if they were to implement something and different, on a, a plugin, for example, they would not have to go and, and um, uh, include all of the code and then couldn't tell what they can actually depend on in CloudStack. So then and in 4.4, we come to uh, a IAM design. So uh, Min and Prachi has written a IAM, IAM plugin and for access control and a ACLs, right? I, for, uh, for CloudStack. And this is how they designed their IAM plugin. And, and we were not able to do this two years ago. Uh, uh, a, a plugin in like this would be completely intermingled with all of CloudStack's code. Uh, so in this plugin, and um, it has two parts. As, um, as they specify in their, in their functional spec, uh, they have the aspiration that the actual server uh, portion of IAM um, may one day run as an actual service where other, uh, other, other services can use it as, uh, for, for access control. Oh, but today it runs in, inside um, uh, CloudStack's management server. Um, it, they separated it into two parts. One is an actual plugin and that understands CloudStack's code uh, that implements uh, CloudStack's two, uh, three interfaces to allow CloudStack to check for API access, entity access, and allow CloudStack to return on entity queries um, uh, filtered by this access. Uh, so that's in the um, uh, plugin code. 
Oh, but then ma the majority of the uh, logic is actually inside the server package, which is to the right, I, and it is uh, separated from um, Cloud Stack itself. So uh, underneath, when you look at the um, little purple boxes, this is the dependency of uh, Cloud Stack's IAM package uh, on Cloud Stack, and the number of things that it actually depends and is very, very low now. Um, it only wants uh, a framework for uh, retrieving a, a config framework uh, for retrieving its configurations, uh, a DB, uh, the DB framework so that it can access its own DB tables, uh, uh, and the managed context so that it can also uh, uh, print out the same context as, as, uh, of a job. Uh, you know, that, so that's the framework portion. Um, but inside Cloud Stack, all it needs is the Cloud Utils and the Cloud API. I, in order for it to interact with Cloud Stack. Uh, so, uh, so then, and, and at this point, then the com compilation boundaries are sufficient for, for them to separate their code away from Cloud Stack itself. So I'm, I'm actually quite proud that we, we achieved this because it, it, it has taken us about two years to get to this point. Uh, but we, we have more to do, I think. And, and in order for us to make this as um, even better, and especially in terms of the scaling and the uh, fault out tolerance portion of it, uh, we have to be able to service the jobs infrastructure that we, we somewhat has hidden away from, from, from the administrator today. Uh, today, a, someone can file a job, uh, they can retrieve the status of that job, whether it completed or whether it has an error, and, and then that, that's it. They, they have no view of what this job and how far this job has went through in, in all of this queuing that, that CloudStack has done. And, and we need to be able to service that because under load, under scale, uh, people then, and when they look through CloudStack, it became just a plain black box. They have no idea what CloudStack is actually doing. Uh, and there's a lot of people who are complaining about HA, for example. Uh, and HA has its own queue, but none of its queue and what it's doing is actually service to, to the administrator. Uh, and then and because it's such a black box to the administrator, the administrator would, would complain that they have no control of HA. And when things are not predictive to the operator or uh, to the administrator, then and, and it becomes useless to them. Um, and so then we need to uh, uh, unify these queues into the same jobs infrastructure. As I said before, the queues that we have today are implemented in many different ways, sometimes with different tables. Uh, but now we do have a, a, a jobs queue uh, uh, interface that allows us to, uh, to um, have all of the processes use the same, same infrastructure. And then we need to give final control to the operator um, so that they can tell us which queues are, are important on to, to fine tune, on, on increases size, increase the jobs, uh, the threats that's actually working on these queues. Else. And then we need to present a better view of that jo uh, these job requests to, to the operators. Uh, um, and we need to uh, give them uh, ability to uh, dynamically scale these queues and, and monitor uh, the, the queues. Uh, now, uh, the other part about uh, being able to fit, fit it into this architecture is that we need to be able to define better stages in CloudStack. Uh, so we need to further clean up all of the plugins so that today, I mean, we, we break out the code today, but uh, if you look in the plugins, other than the new plugins that we are writing, and the original plugins are still somewhat intermixed because it still relies on, on, the, um, on the CloudStack code. Um, uh, Cloud Stack uh, server code. Uh, so we need to do a lot more work in cleaning that, uh, those plugins in. And we need to move Agent Manager into the framework because Agent Manager in Cloud Stack today is the way hey, to do uh, messaging to the actual resources. Uh, and, and that is the place where it controls the queues to each hardware resource and which ones we should terminate if there's an error, uh, things like that. Uh, and then the original uh, packages, we need to find the right places to place them. Um, I have not done that work yet because it, it, it is a bit of work to, uh, to place them in the right place uh, because packaging is actually difficult. Uh, it affects packaging, and, but we need to do that. Okay. 
So that's the end of my slide there. Well, it's five minutes. Yeah, so we have five more minutes. Let, let me finish up a little bit. Uh, I, I actually thought I had about an hour, so I was going to uh, write some more about uh, designing for scale and fault isolation in CloudStack. Uh, so going through CloudStack's code today, I think we do do a, a bit of work in terms of, of scaling CloudStack uh, because um, we do uh, make sure the data paths and control paths are, are separated, uh, for example. Um, but we have not done enough to make sure all of our operations are item potent. Um, because part of, the, part of this particular architecture is that when you are called upon to, uh, to perform the same stage twice, you need to be able to still perform it correctly. And, uh, and so then and we need to be aware of that when we're writing our code. Um, and then and through the last five years or so of dealing with customers and, and crisis in, in data centers, uh, I realized when we're writing our code, we really need to look at a priority in, the, um, in our code. We need to first take the VM stability to be the top priority in all, in all of our code. Um, and that generally has to do with the VM's storage data path, how they access the data. Um, and then the VM's availability is the second priority. And, uh, and that usually involves the VM's network traffic paths. Uh, then and you have operational data paths such as snapshots that people perform, um, administrators perform on behalf of the VMs. Um, and finally, then and you have a control path for, for CloudStack. And people, uh, administrators are not quite as worried about management server being down for an hour or two hours. But availability to the, to, to the end user's VMs and the stability of the end user's VMs are extremely important. And so when we're writing a code, we, we need to think about that. Uh, and we need to go through uh, very carefully and think about, does my code actually uh, think about these priorities. Uh, is. All right, thank you. If there's any questions, I'll take them now. I guess we have three minutes left, so. Sure. Yeah, on the previous slide, uh, you're talking about the operations being item potent. Is that uh, mainly stuff that's invisible to the end user, or does it include operations that the user might take, like if they send some API call twice and it right. still works? Well, I think if, if all of the pieces, all of the stages in the process are item potent, then that process itself will be item potent. And so uh, uh, if we write it correctly, uh, then uh, an end user should be able to send that twice and we should still uh, react correctly. Uh, but it needs every single stage to be, to be done correctly. Okay, well, thank you.